Hello. I have been spending some time reading Carl Jung's The Red Book, Libra Novus. I've been reading the Reader's Edition, edited by Sonu Shamadasani. I'm going to be reading today from page 299. I'm reading The Incantations. See the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it, and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. Thus, do not speak and do not show the God but sit in a solitary place and sing incantations in the ancient manner. You can find images that go along with the poem if you have the Red Book art book. Carl Jung made some pretty amazing art documenting his journey into the underworld, his own unconscious. And what I'm going to be reading, basically, and commenting on, are kind of my experience as I experience his experience <laughs> through the Red Book. I've done a lot of preliminary study about Carl Jung and read some of his other work and I've read a lot of commentary, listened to a lot of YouTube commentary. I particularly enjoyed the Library of Congress um, sessions. There's two sessions. I'll put them in the description. They, uh, there's an exhibit at the Library of Congress. The Red Book is kind of was 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 presented in Thomas Jefferson's library, which is ironic because they seem very. Thomas Jefferson seems like a proto young figure type figure but anyway those are very interesting content uh, kind of background to the red book and why it was written uh it was released i believe in 2009 or 10 uh or maybe eight um by his family and some caretakers of his work and there's going to be other work that will be released as well it's uh it's quite a fascinating um book and it's quite uh Carl Jung is an extraordinary person. Some have said, you know, the red book could be his mad ramblings and he was such a genius that he was just able to create and weave very intricate stories, but I read his work in the red book as myths of the soul. He's worked to connect to the energy that is mythically referred to as the diamond. D-A-I-M-O-N. Perhaps there's a correlation between the diamond, the ancient Greek idea of the diamond, and the god of the egg that I just referred to from page 299, The Incantations. I'm going to actually backtrack a little bit. We're going to start on page 277 of the Red Book Reader. Um, this is the first day. But on the third night, a desolate mountain range blocks my way. Though a narrow valley gorge allows me to enter, the way leads inevitably between two high rock faces. My feet are bare and injure themselves on the jagged rocks. Here the path becomes slippery. One half of the way is white, the other half black. I step onto the black side and recoil, recoil horrified. It is a hot iron. I step onto the white half, it is like ice. But so it must be. I dart across and onward, and finally the valley widens into a mighty rocky basin. A narrow path winds up along vertical rocks to the mountain ridge at the top. As I approach the top, a mighty booming resounds from the other side of the mountain, like ore being pounded. The sound gradually swells and echoes thunderously in the mountain. As I reach the pass, I see an enormous man approaching from the other side. Two bullhorns rise from his great head, and a rattling suit of armor covers his chest. 
His black beard is ruffled and decked with exquisite stones. The giant is carrying a sparkling double axe in his hand like those used to strike bulls. Before I can recover from my amazed fright, the giant is standing before me. I look at his face. It is faint and pale and deeply wrinkled. His almond-shaped eyes look at me astonished. Horror takes hold of me. This is Isdubar, the mighty, the bull man. He stands and looks at me. His face speaks of consuming inner fear, and his hands and knees tremble. Isdubar, the powerful bull, trembling? Is he frightened? I call out to him. Um, an interesting note here. Isdubar was an early name given the figure now known as Gilgamesh. Um, this was based on a mistranscription. In 1906, Peter Jensen noted, it has now been established that Gilgamesh is the chief protagonist of the epic and not Gishjabar or, or Isdabar, as assumed previously. Jung had discussed the Gilgamesh epic in 1912 in his transformations and symbols of the libido using the corrected form and cited Jensen's work several times. So, uh, yeah, there is definitely this correlation with the bull and Enkidu, um, I think, uh, from Gilgamesh story. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, on with the dialogue on top of 278. Oh, Isdubar, most powerful, spare my life and forgive me for lying like a worm in your path. I do not want your life. Where do you come from? I come from the West. You come from the West. Do you know the Western lands? Is this the right way to the Western lands? I think it's interesting that he portrays this God as not knowing, demigod as not knowing which way to go. I come from a Western land, I say, whose coast washes against the great Western sea. Does the sunk in, does the sun sink in th into the sea or does it touch the solid land in its decline? The sun sinks far beyond the sea. Beyond the sea, what lies there? There is nothing but empty space there. As you know, the earth is round, and moreover, it turns around the sun. Damned one, where do you get such knowledge? So there is no immortal land where the sun goes down to be reborn? Are you speaking the truth? His eyes flicker with fury and fear. He steps a thundering pace closer. I tremble. O oh, Isdubar, most powerful one, forgive my presumptuousness, but I am really speaking the truth. I come from a land where this is proven science and where people live who travel round the world with their ships. Our scholars know through measurement how far the sun is from each point of the surface on the earth. It is a celestial body that lies unspeakably far out in unending space. Um, I think this is very interesting because this is, you know, we're going, this is a vision probably that Young is writing automatically. And, um, I think it's interesting. He's speaking as if like he's a science fiction character from the future who's now back speaking to this fantasy character in fantasy land, which is basically what is happening. He's in, he's using his active imagination and he's speaking to these, to these, uh, having a dialogue within himself. So, all right. Top of 279. Uh, is Dubar is speaking here. Unending, did you say? Is the space of the world unending and we can never reach the sun? Most powerful one, insofar as you are mortal, you can never reach the sun. I see him overcome with suffocating fear. I am mortal, and I shall never reach the sun and never reach immortality. He smashes his axe with a powerful, clinging blow on the rock. Be gone, miserable weapon. You are not much use. How should you be of use against infinity, against the eternal void? And against the unreplenishable, there is no one left for you to conquer. Smash yourself, what it's, what it's worth. In the west, the sun sinks into the lap of glowing clouds and bright crimson. So go away, sun, thrice damned God, and wrap yourself in your immortality. He snatches the smashed piece of his axe from the ground and hurls it at the sun. Here, have your sacrifice, your last sacrifice. He collapses and sobs like a child. I stand shaking and hardly dare stir. Miserable worm, where did you suckle on this poison? Oh, Isdabar, most powerful one. What you call poison, I call science. In our country, we are nurtured on it from youth, and that may be the one reason that we, have properly, that we haven't properly flourished and remain so dwarfish. When I see you, however, it seems to me as if we are all somewhat poisoned. No stronger being has ever cut me down. No monster has ever resisted my strength. But your poison, worm which you have placed in my, in my way has lamed me to the marrow. 
Your magical poison is stronger than the army of Tiamat. That in Babylonian mythology, Tiamat is the mother of the gods who waged war with an army of demons. He lies as if paralyzed, stretched out on the ground. You gods, help, here lies your son, cut down by the invisible serpent's bite and his heel. Oh, if only I had crushed you when I saw you and I and never heard your words. Hmm. So perhaps Isdabar represents, you know, like it definitely the divine hero. So he has all those heroic qualities within us and they are our higher self. You know, that this is what our higher self is. And it descends, there's, a, there, you know, there's some, I love, I love how it's written about, you know, the higher self descends like a bird from, the, from, from heaven and it comes down and, and it's drawn by humility um, within the person. So there's, you know, that, that this, this meeting has happened here for Jung and he's now, you know, conversing, you know, with this, with this entity within him. So uh, continuing on, um, Jung says, O oh, Isdabar, great and pitiable one, had I known that my knowledge could cut you down, I would have held my tongue, but I wanted to speak the truth. You call poison truth? Is poison truth or is truth poison? Do not our astrologers and priests also speak the truth? And yet theirs does not act like poison. O oh, Isdabar, night is falling and it will get cold up here. Shall I not fetch you help from men? Let it be, and answer me instead. But we cannot philosophize here, of all places. Your wretched condition demands help. I say to you, let it be. If I should perish this night, so be it. Just give me an answer. I'm afraid my words are weak if they are, if they are to heal. They cannot bring about something more grave. The disaster has already happened. So tell me what you know. Perhaps you, have, you even have a magic word that counteracts the poison. My words... O oh, most powerful one, are poor and have no magical power. No matter, speak. I don't doubt that your priests speak the truth. It is certainly a truth. Only it runs contrary to your truth. Are there then two sorts of truth? It seems to me to be so. Our truth is that which comes to us from the knowledge of outer things. The truth of your priests is that which comes from your inner things. From inner things. Half sitting up. That was a salutatory word. I'm fortunate that my weak words have relieved you. Oh, if only I knew many more words that could help you. It has now grown cold and dark. I'll make a fire to warm us. Do that as it might help. I gathered wood and lit a big fire. The holy fire warms me. Now tell me, how did you make a fire so swiftly and mysteriously? All I need are matches. Look. They are small pieces of wood with a special substance at the tip. Rubbing them against the box produces fire. That is astonishing. Where did you learn this art? Everyone has matches where I'm from, but this is the least of it. We can also fly with the help of useful machines. You can fly like birds. If your words did not contain such powerful magic, I would say to you, you were lying. I'm certainly not lying. Look, I, have also, I also have a timepiece, for example, which shows the exact time of day. That is wonderful. It is clear that you come from a strange and marvelous land. You certainly come from the blessed western lands. Are you a mortal? A mortal? I? There is nothing more mortal than we are. What? You're not even a mortal, and yet you understand such arts? Unfortunately, our science has still not yet succeeded in finding a method against death. Who then taught you such arts? In the course of the centuries, men have made many discoveries through precise observation in the science of outer things. But this science is the awful magic that has lamed me. How can it be that you are still alive even though you drink from this poison every day? We've grown accustomed to this poison over time because men get used to everything, but we're still somewhat lamed. On the other hand, this science has also some great advantages as you've seen. What we've lost in terms of force, we've discovered many times through mastering the force of nature. Isn't it pathetic to be, a, to be so wounded? For my part, I draw my own force from the force of nature. I leave the secret force to the cowardly conjurers and womanly magicians. If I crush another skull to pulp, that will stop his awful magic quick enough. But don't you realize how the, tor how the touch of our magic has worked upon you? Terribly, I think. Unfortunately, you are right. Now you perhaps see that we had no choice. We had to swallow the poison of science. Otherwise, we would have met the same fate as you have. We'd be completely lamed. 
if we, encom- if we encountered it unsuspecting and unprepared. This poison is so insurmountably strong that everyone, even the strongest and even the eternal gods, perish because of it. If our life is dear to us, we prefer to sacrifice a piece of our life force rather than abandon ourselves to certain death. I no longer think that you have come from the blessed western lands. Your country must be desolate, full of paralysis and renunciation. I yearn for the east where the pure source of our life-giving wisdom flows. We sit silently at the flickering fire. The night is cold. Isdubar groans and looks up at the starry sky above. Most terrible day of my life, unending, so long, so long, wretched magical art. Our priests know nothing, or else they could have protected me from it. Even the gods die, he says. Have you no gods anymore? No words are all we have. No words are all we have, but are these words powerful? So they claim, but one notices nothing of this. We do not see the gods either, and yet we believe that they exist. We recognize their workings in natural events. Science has taken from us the capacity of belief. What you have lost, what, you have lost that too? How then do you live? We live thus, with one foot in the cold and one foot in the hot, and for the rest come what may. You express yourself darkly. So it is also is with us. So it is also is with us. It is dark. Can you bear it? Not particularly well. I personally don't find myself at ease with it. For that reason, I've set out for the Far East, the land of the rising sun, to seek the light that we lack. Where then does the sun rise? The earth is, as you say, completely round. Thus the sun rises nowhere. I mean, do you have a light that we lack? I asked. Look at me. I flourish in the light of the eastern world. From this you can measure how fruitful this light is. But if you come from such a dark land, then beware of such an overpowering light. You could go blind, just as we all are somewhat blind. If your light is as fantastic as you are, then I will be careful. You do well by this. I long for your truth, I said. As I long for the western lands, I warn you. Silence descends. It is late at night. We fall asleep next to the fire. Wow, that was some dialogue. Okay, continuing on, on 283. I wandered south and found the unbearable heat of solitude with myself. I wandered no- toward the north and found the cold death from which all the world dies. I withdrew to my western land where the men are rich in knowing and doing, and I began to suffer from the sun's empty darkness, and I threw everything from me and wandered toward the east, where the light rises daily. I went to the east like a child. I did not ask. I simply waited. Cheerful flowery meadows and lovely spring forests hemmed my path, but in the third night the heaviness came. It stood before me like a range of cliffs full of sorrowful desolation, and everything tried to deter me from following my life's path. But I found the entrance to the narrow way. The torment was great, since it was not for nothing that I had pushed the two dissipated and dissolute ones away from me. I unsuspectingly absorb what I reject. What I accept enters that part of my soul which I do not know. I accept what I do to myself, but I reject what is done to me. So the path of my life led me beyond the rejected opposites, united in smooth and, alas, extremely painful sides of the way which lay before me. I stepped on... I stepped on them, but they burned and froze my souls. And thus I reached the other side. But the poison of the serpent, whose head you crush, enters you through the wound in your heel, and thus the serpent becomes more dangerous than it was before. Since whatever I reject is nevertheless in my nature, I thought it was without, and so I believed that I could destroy it. But it resides in me and has only assumed a passing outer form and stepped toward me. I destroyed its form and believed that I was a conqueror, but I have not yet overcome myself. The outer opposition is an image of an inner opposition. Once I realize this, I remain silent and think of the chasm of antagonism in my soul. Outer oppositions are easy to overcome. They indeed exist, but nevertheless you can be united with yourself. They will indeed burn and freeze your souls, but only your souls. It hurts, but you continue and look toward distant goals. As I rose to the highest point, and my hope wanted to look out toward the east, a miracle happened. As I moved toward the east, one from the east hurried toward me, and strove toward the sinking light. I wanted light. He wanted night. I wanted to rise. He wanted to sink. 
I was dwarfish like a child, while he was enormous like an elementally powerful hero. Knowledge lamed me, while he was blinded by the fullness of the light. And so we hurried toward each other. He from the light, I from the darkness. He strong, I weak. He God, I serpent. He ancient, I utterly new. He unknowing, I knowing. He fantastic, I sober. He brave, powerful, I cowardly and cunning. But we were both astonished to see one another on the border between morning and evening. I was a child. This is page 285 um, as a marker here. I was a child and grew like a greening tree and let the wind and distant cries and common opposites blow calmly through my branches. I was a boy and mocked fallen heroes. I was a youth pushing aside their cluttered grips left and right, and so I did not anticipate the powerful, blind, and immortal one who wandered longingly after the sinking sun, who wanted to leave the, cleave the ocean down to its bottom so he could descend into the source of life. That which hurries toward the rising is small. That which approaches the descent is great. Hence I was small, since I simply came from the depths of my descent. I had been where he yearned to be. He who descends is great, and it would be easy for him to smash me. A god who looks like the sun does not hunt worms, but the worm, the serpent, aims at the heel of the powerful one and will prepare him for the descent that he needs. His power is great and blind. He is marvelous to look at and frightening, but the serpent finds its spot, a little poison, and the great one falls. The words of the one who rises have no sound and taste bitter. It is not a sweet poison, but one that is fatal for all gods. Alas, he is my dearest, most beautiful friend. He who rushes across, pursuing the sun and wanting to marry himself with the immeasurable mother as the sun does. How closely akin, indeed, how completely one are the serpent and the god. The word which was our deliverer has become a deadly weapon, a serpent that secretly stabs. So uh, just an aside here. So, uh, wow, <laughs> that, is, uh, that was quite a dialogue between Young and Isdabar, the bull, the bull hero. Um, and then the little commentary after was Young kind of um, just kind of as the character, his character in his vision, he was kind of processing um, and provided this metaphor, the serpent biting the heel of the god. That's that's a powerful myth, and uh, you'll you'll find that you know a lot of examples of that in our stories. Um, Achilles Achilles he uh, you know Achilles heel, basically um, when he was shot with an arrow. Um, so there, there are some interesting things here. I think um, he he jumps across different perceptions. It's like he's changing a tuner, a radio tuner. He's, he's a tree. He's a boy. He's a serpent. He's a man. Um, it's very interesting. So he's, he's kind of very schizophrenically, I think, jumping kind of, but he's showing something here that it's a common experience. Uh, it's kind of following a continuum here. Um, he's kind of sharing like a soul view of life, you know, what does it feel like to have multiple masks and faces and extensions of yourself all happening at once together? You know, that's kind of the feeling I get reading his words here. So it makes me, this is a very powerful metaphor for me. This is a powerful myth image, mythical image of the God being bit by the serpent, meeting, you know, um, the serpent has what the God needs, the God has what the serpent wants. And they help each other in a very powerful way. They're balancing each other. Um, wow. Uh, you know, got to read that one quite, a, you know, a number of times. I think every time I would get a little more out of it. So uh, let's continue on. Uh, middle of page, bottom of page 285 in the, the Red Book uh, Reader Edition. No longer do outer opposites stand in my way, but my own opposite comes toward me and rises up hugely before me. And we block each other's way. The word of the serpent certainly defeats the danger, but the, my way remains barred since I had then had to fall from paralysis into blindness, just as the powerful one fell into paralysis to escape his blindness. 
I cannot reach the blinding power of the sun, just as he, the powerful one, cannot reach the ever-fruitful womb of darkness. Uh, an aside here. Uh, so the womb of darkness, uh, this was spoken about earlier in the chapter that I didn't read. Um, the womb of darkness is, uh, is, is our mother, the, the, you know, the, the goddess uh, who we're born from, uh, the, warm, the warm darkness. Um, <laughs> a lot of, uh, yeah. So, um, and, and this is what the powerful one is longing for. He wants to find, you know, this womb of darkness. It's an old story, I guess. Uh, lived out in the stars even, um, you know, uh, and the gods, the gods within us, living us, you know. You get a feeling through this that they're just powerful forces within human beings and we are just this like crossing of all these different, you know, energy channels or energy forces, energetic forces. And what happens is just exploding in the moment, always changing, always becoming just an explosion of color and life, you know, within time. And, um, I mean, that's a, that's just, you know, that's how it feels, you know, it's just, it's an explosion of connectivity. And I guess that's what you would call, may call awareness, but anyway, um, continuing on, I seem to be denied power while he is denied rebirth, but I escape the blindness that comes with power and he escapes the nothingness that comes with death. My hope for the fullness of the light shatters, just as his longing for boundless conquered life shatters. I had felled the strongest, and the God climbs down to mortality. And there's a poem here on page 286. The mighty one fell, he lies on the ground. Power must subside for the sake of life. The circumference of outer life should be made. Uh, by the way, these were images 41 and 42 that go along with the poem, if you, if you're, if you can find those. A lot of the images from the Red Book are numbered, uh, so you, you may find those if you search for them on the internet. Much more secrecy, solitary fires, fire, caverns, dark, wide forests, sparsely peopled settlements, quietly flowing streams, silent winter and summer nights, small ships and carriages, and secure in dwellings the rare and precious. From afar, wanderers walk along solitary roads, look here and there, hurrying becomes impossible, patience grows. The noise of the days of the world, this is now image 42, the noise of the days of the world falls silent and the warming fire blazes inside. Sitting at the fire, the shades of those gone before wail softly and give news of the past. Come to the solitary fire, you blind and lame ones, and hear of both kinds of truth. The blind will be lamed and the lamed will be blinded. Yet the shared fire warms both in the lengthening night. An old secret fire burns between us, giving sparse light and ample warmth. <clears throat> the primordial fire that conquers every necessity shall burn again, since the night of the world is wide and cold and the need is great. The well-protected fire brings together those from far away and those who are cold, those who do not see one another and cannot reach one another, and it conquers suffering and shatters need. The words uttered at the fire are ambiguous and deep and show life the right way. The blind shall be lamed so that he will not run into the abyss, and the lamed shall be blind so that he will not look at things beyond his reach with longing and contempt. Both may be aware of their deep helplessness so that they will respect the holy fire again as well as shades sitting at the hearth and the words that encircle the flames. It's the end of the poem. The ancients called the saving word the logos, an expression of divine reason. So much unreason was in man that he needed reason to be saved. If one waits long enough, one sees how the gods all change into serpents and underworld dragons in the end. This is also the fate of the logos. In the end, it poisons us all. In time, we were all poisoned, but unknowingly, we kept the one, the powerful one, the eternal wanderer in us away from the poison. We spread the poison and paralysis around us, and that we want to educate all the world around us into reason. Some have their reason in thinking, others in feeling. Both are servants, though, of the Logos, and in secret become worshippers of the serpent. You can subjugate yourself, shackle yourself in irons, whip yourself bloody every day. You have crushed yourself, but not overcome yourself. 
Precisely through this, you have helped the powerful one, strengthened your paralysis, and promoted his blindness. He would like to see it in others and inflict it on them, and would like to force the Logos on you and others, longingly and tyrannically with blind obstinacy and vacant stubbornness. You can see God coming down and being like, Thus I have a commandment, this shall be done thusly. <laughs> uh, that's kind of the image I have of this passage. Anyway, give him a taste of Logos. He is afraid, and he already trembles from afar, since he suspects that he has become outdated, and that a tiny droplet of the poison of Logos will paralyze him. But because he is your beautiful, much-loved brother, you will act slavishly toward him, and you would like to spare him. As you have spared none of your fellow men, you spared no Mary and no powerful means to strike your, to strike your fellow men with the poisoned arrow. Paralyzed game is an unworthy prey. The powerful huntsman who wrestles the bull to the ground and tears the lion to pieces and strikes the army of Tiamat is your bow's worthy target. If you live as he whom you are, he will come running against you impetuously and you can hardly miss him. He will lay violent hands on you and force you into slavery if you do not remember your terrible weapon, which you have always used in his service against yourself. You will be cunning, terrible, and cold if you make the beautiful and much-loved fall. But you should not kill him, even if he suffers and rides in unbearable agony. Bind the holy Sebastian to a tree and slowly and rationally shoot it arrow after arrow into his twitching flesh. Wow, that's an image right there. Um, when you do so, remind yourself that each arrow that strikes him spares one of your dwarfish and lame brothers, so you may shoot many arrows into, into him. But there is a misunderstanding that occurs all too frequently and is almost ineradicable. Men always want to destroy the beautiful and much loved outside of themselves, but never within themselves. He, the beautiful and most loved one, came to me from the east from just that place which I was seeking to reach. Admiringly, I saw his power and magnificence and beauty, and I recognized that he was striving for precisely what I had abandoned, namely my dark human milling crowd of, of abjection. I recognized the blindness and unknowingness of his striving, which worked against my desire, and I opened his eyes and lamed his powerful limbs with a poison stab, and he lay crying like a child, as that which he was, a child, a primordial grown child that required human logos. So he lay before me, helpless, my blind God, who had become half-seeing and paralyzed, and compassion seized me, since it was plain to me that I should not let him die. He who approached me from the rising, from the place where he could be well, but which I could never teach. He whom I sought I now possessed. The East could give me nothing other than him, the sick and fallen one. You need to undertake only half of the way. The God will undertake the other half. If you go beyond him, blindness will befall you. If he goes beyond you, paralysis will befall him. Now, this is an aside. I believe that this myth and metaphor, um, I believe that uh, the, the, the God is actually an op, the opposite sex. And, um, and also, I also think that um, kind of going along with active imagination here, you have to use active imagination um, a, a literal person is not going to be able to understand Jung. A literal person is not going to be able to let to re-energize the myths in their life. Uh, it's going to be very challenging for a rational, reasonable person. So I've done a lot of work to kind of expand my intuition and to be kind of to, to learn, to integrate Wu Wei uh, into my life, which is doing, not doing, which is spontaneous action. And uh, that has developed some really interesting skills um, and, and uncovered some psychic ability that I didn't ever know that was possible. I'm developing that and working on that and focusing on that in my personal meditation. But that's because I believe the sense, you know, what, what comes with reading the myths and studying the myths becomes a sensitivity to our deeper history and story and to the deeper, I think, images that are you know, I believe as young that the unconscious connects us, um, you know, across all people. And that's fascinating to, uh, consequently, they fell into the hands of the living God. They learned to kneel and to lie with their faces down, to beg for pity, 
and they learned to live in servile fear and to be grateful. But he who saw him, the terrible beautiful one with his black velvet eyes and the long eyelashes, the eyes that do not see but merely gaze lovingly and fearfully, he has learned to cry out and whimper so that he can at least reach the ear of the Godhead. Only your fearful cry can stop the God. And then you see that the God also trembles since he stands confronting his face, his observing gaze in you, and he feels unknown power. The God is afraid of man. If my God is lamed, I must stand by him since I cannot abandon the much loved. I sense that he is my lot, my brother, who abided and grew in the light while I was in the darkness and fed myself with poison. It is good to know such things. If we are surrounded by the night, our brother stands in the fullness of the light, doing his great deeds, tearing up the lion and killing the dragon. That's very interesting as well. I mean, powerful imagery and very alchemical and uh, kind of ties in with some mythology, esoteric kind of writing about, you know, the, the holy guardian angel which I think there's a correlation here between the Holy Guardian Angel from Theosophy, or sorry, from um, Thelema, Aleister Crowley's Thelema, and, uh, and, and that, that magical um, kind of working, and, and this God that, that's being described um, on a heroic level. Like, just imagine like a hero, you know? I mean, that's what this thing is inside of you. And it's always on another plane doing possibly its heroic things. And somehow it's connected here and drawn here and we're drawn there. And, you know, there's a whole nother world, a whole nother mode of being and mythologies. And I mean, it's possible. I feel like I'm butting up against this mythology and it feels very deeply resonant. Like, uh, you know, I've been here before. There's a path here already. I see in the woods. So it's very interesting to me just to kind of explore through this and, and kind of, in, you know, I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm envisioning, you know, these scenes and they're such rich, you know, scenes to look into in your mind and, you, you know, things occur to you. So, okay, back to the reading. Continuing uh, from the top of uh, 290. And he draws his bow against ever more distant goals until he becomes aware of the sun wandering high up in the sky and wants to catch it. But when he has discovered his valuable prey, then your longing for the light also awakens. You discard the fetters and take yourself to the place of the rising light. Uh, okay, so jumping out here. So basically what's being described here is as that being feels drawn towards this world and you are drawn towards its world, somehow, you know, one or the other, you guys pull on each other. Uh, and as I said, I like to envision this as an opposite sex kind of spirit. Okay, back to the reading. And thus you rush toward each other. He believed he could simply capture the sun and encounter the worm of the shadows, the serpent. You thought that in the east you could drink from the source of the light that you saw and catch the horned giant before whom, before whom you fall on your knees. His essence is blind, excessive longing and tempestuous force. My essence is seeing limitation and the incapacity of cleverness. He possesses in abundance what I lack. Consequently, I will also not let him go, the bull god who once wounded Jacob's hip and whom I now have lamed. I want to make his force my own. It is therefore prudent to keep alive the severely infl afflicted so that the force continues to support me. We miss nothing more than divine force. We say, yes, indeed, this is how it should or could be. This is... This is that should be achieved. This is this or that should be achieved. We speak thus and stand thus and look about us embarrassed to see whether somehow something will occur. And should something happen, we look on and say, yes, indeed, we understand. It is this or that, or it is similar to this or that. And thus we speak and stand and look around to see whether somewhere something might happen. Something always happens. We do not, but we do not happen, since our God is sick. We have seen him dead with the venomous gaze of the basilisk on his face, and we have understood that he is dead. We must think of his healing, and yet again I feel quite clearly that my life would have broken in half had I failed to heal my God. Hence I abided with him in the long cold night. And then there's a reference to image 44 and 45 um, there. 
And then we're going on to, there's an image 46 uh, for the next section, which is the second day, picking up in the middle of page 291. Um, you know, I think Young poked out a little bit there at the end, saying he, you can feel his passion that whatever force he's found within himself, it needed his attention. And that's actually something that uh, the ancients, pre-Socratics that I've been studying, some mystical philosophers and the physicos type healers, they would use incubation and they would take somebody down into the depths of the underworld and um, they called that attending to the gods. Like it was some kind of like, you know, dreaming is one thing we do, right? Which clears out psychic, you know, maybe neuro neurological kind of cruff. But this, doing this work, going into the underworld, clears out soul level uh, blockages. And there's an image that Jung has, a uh, powerful image of saying that until you remove these serpents or, or worms that are attached to you, that they block your energy, uh, <laughs> you know, your energy flows. You know, I mean, met speaking mythically, metaphorically, and imaginatively, that makes sense. Uh, there's an aspect of all of this that is magical, imaginal. You know, what, what mag what, whatever is effective, magic cares about what's effective and what works. We don't need to understand it rationally. And actually, the rational mind is actually a real blocker to psychic phenomena and to uh, irrationality. So we have to kind of bring the irrational underneath the carpet, sneak it in the back door of the house um, to introduce it. To That was a master stroke. Where are you carrying me? I'm going to carry you down into the Western land. My comrades will happily accommodate such a large fantasy as you. Once we have crossed the mountains and have reached the houses of hospitable men, I can calmly go about finding a means to restore you completely again. Carrying him on my back, I climb down the small rock path with great care, more in danger of being whirled aloft by the wind than by, of losing my balance because of my load and plunging down the mountainside. I hang on to, to my all-too-lightweight load. Finally, we reach the bottom of the valley in the way of the hot and cold pain. But this time I am blown by a whistling east wind down through the narrow rocks and across the fields toward in inhabited places, making no contact with the painful way of hot and cold. Spurred on, I hasten through beautiful lands. I see two people ahead of me, Ammonius and the Red One. Uh, by the way, these are characters from earlier in the story. Uh, and the Red One is the devil. Um, when we are right behind them, they turn and run off into the fields with horrified cries. I must have proved a strange sight indeed. Who are these misshapen ones? Are these your comrades? Isdubar asked. These are not men. They are so-called relics of the past, which one still often encounters in the Western lands. They used to be very important. They're now used mostly as shepherds. What a wondrous country. But look, isn't that a town? Don't you want to go there? No, God forbid. I don't want a crowd to gather, since the enlightened live there. Can't you smell them? They're actually dangerous, since they cook the strongest poisons from which uh, even I must protect myself. The people there are totally paralyzed, wrapped in a brown poisonous vapor, and can only move with artificial means. But you need not worry. Night has almost fallen, and no one will see us. Moreover, no one would admit to having seen me. I know an out-of-the-way house there. I have close friends there who will take us in for the night. Isdabar and I come to a quiet garden in a secluded house. I hide Isdabar under the drooping branches of a tree, go up to the door of the house and knock. I ponder the door. It is much too small. I will never be able to get Isdabar th uh, through it. Yet a fantasy takes up no space. Why did this excellent thought not occur to me earlier? I return to the garden and with no difficulty squeeze Isdabar into the size of an egg and put him in my pocket. Then I walk into the welcoming house with Isdabar, um, where Isdabar should be, uh, should find healing. Uh, that's interesting, you know, really interesting allusion there or correspondence with Alice in Wonderland. Uh, in the fantasy world, you know, anything is possible. So you just have to kind of, uh, you know, find the, solve the riddles within the symbology and you can kind of do whatever you need to do. Uh, it's not going to be rational. It's not going to be explainable. It's probably not going to be logical all the time. But um, uh, but actually, the unconscious uh, mechanical processes are fairly logical uh, in their operation, actually. Um, so, anyway. 
All right, back to page 295, bottom of 295. Thus, my God found salvation. He was saved precisely by what one would actually consider fatal, namely by declaring him a figment of the imagination. How often has it been assumed that the gods have been brought to their end in this way? This was obviously a serious mistake, since this was precisely what saved the god. He did not pass away, but became a living fantasy, whose workings I could feel on my own body, my inherent heaviness faded, and the hot and cold way of pain no longer burned and froze my souls any longer. The weight no longer kept me pressed to the ground either, but instead the wind carried me lightly like a feather in life while I carried the giant. I find that to just be a beautiful passage about the lightness of being once you've let your burden go. Uh, I mean, that that's really cool. I like that a lot. Back to the reading. One used to believe that one could murder a god, but the god was saved. He forged a new axe in the fire and plunged again into the flood of light of the east to resume his ancient cycle. But we clever men crept around lamed and poisoned and did not even know that we lacked something. But I loved my God, and I took him to the house of men, since I was convinced that he also really lived as a fantasy, and should therefore not be left behind, wounded and sick. Um, and hence I experienced the miracle of my body losing its heaviness when I burdened, my, when I burdened myself with the God. St. Christopher the giant bore his burden with difficulty, despite the fact that he bore only the Christ child. But I was, see, now this is interesting. He, he basically jumped to a, a, a person in history, St. Christopher, and described how, how for Christopher, the God within himself had the image of the Christ child, and he bore that and carried that difficulty. Anyway, but I was, a small, I was as small as a child, and I bore a giant, and yet my burden lifted me up. The Christ child became an easy burden for the giant Christopher, since Christ himself said, My yoke is sweet and my burden is light. We should not bear Christ as he is unbearable, but we should be Christ, for then our yoke is sweet and our burden easy. This tangible and apparent world is one reality, but fantasy is the other reality. Wow. Let's read that again. This tangible and apparent world around us is one reality, one mode of reality, but fantasy is the other reality, the imaginal, the imagination. And my gosh, I am finding so much richness in other people's kind of accounts of their journeys into their imaginations. I mean, I have so much synchronicity and so much resonance with, with their journeying and my own journeying and my own art that I made as an expression of that synthesis of that God coming down within me and me giving it, giving it life, letting it breathe, letting it shine. And that, that chemical reaction somehow of having intuitive inspiration spontaneously and then letting it out, that is the creative act that somehow connects us deeply with ourselves. So I can really resonate a lot with that. So one more time, let me read this. This tangible and apparent world is one reality, but fantasy is the other reality. So long as we leave the God outside us apparent and tangible, he is unbearable and hopeless. But if we turn God into a fantasy, he is in us and is easy to bear. The God outside us increases the weight of everything heavy, while the God within us lightens everything heavy. Hence, all Christophers have stopped stooped backs and short breath since the world is heavy. <laughs> so on page 297 here at the top of 297 uh also um so this is very interesting i want to i just want to mention also that i have kind of let myself internalize my conception of a god but a god that was sick and dead and a, a god that was sickened and sickened by my own idolatry in the world and, you know, this is another theme that some of the mystical philosophers of today and of the 20th century speak about and write a lot about, um, that they, that the world is full of idol, idols, that we've lost the connection between the idol and the original source of that idol. Um, and because of that, they become empty and distracting. Um, and we live in a world that basically uses culture to provide meaning when, you know, but look, look at how empty that can be, right? I mean, it can provide surface meaning, but it doesn't provide the deep meaning, the kind of meaning that, that, that people like Jung 
are longing for, people like Nietzsche are longing for, right? Herman Hesse, Hesse are longing for, Goethe are longing for, right? William Blake, longing, longing, longing for this depth. I can only, I can only say that I resonate with their longing. I feel that deep longing to go as into the darkness, you know, really. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, so this is, this is a lot of powerful imagery and I really resonate a lot with it. And there's a lot of synchronicities, um, with, with his experience and, and my own experiences. So continuing from the top of 297, many have wanted to get help for their sick God and were then devoured by the serpents and dragons lurking on the way to the land of the sun. They perished in the overbright day and have become dark men since their eyes have been blinded. Now they go around like shadows and speak of the light but see little. But their God is in everything that they do not see. He is in the dark western lands and he sharpens seeing eyes and assists those cooking the poison and he guides the serpents to the heels of the blind perpetrators. Therefore, if you are clever, take the God with you. Then you know where he is. If you do not have him with you in the western lands, he will come running to you at night with clanking armor and a crushing battle axe. If you do not have him with you in the land of the dawn, then you will step unawares on the divine worm who awaits your unsuspecting heel. Wow, that's interesting. Um, because basically, uh, you need each other. There is some force within you that is descending and there's some force in you that is rising and you need each other's help in the, each other's respective land. So this is interesting. This gets interesting, right? I mean, we are deep in Jung's uh, unconscious here. Uh, so, you know, it is his, his experience that we're reading. So we have to remember that. Picking up from the middle of 297. You gain everything from God whom you bear, but not his weapon, since he crushed it. He who conquers needs weapons. But what else do you want to conquer? You cannot conquer more than the earth. And what is the earth? It is round all over and hangs like a, do like a drop in the cosmos. You will not reach the sun, and your power will not even extend to the barren moon. You will conquer neither the sea, nor the snow on the poles, nor the sands of the desert, but only a few spots on the green earth. You will not conquer anything for any length of time. Your power will turn into dust tomorrow, for above all, at the very least, you must conquer death. So do not be a fool. Throw down your weapon. God himself smashed his weapon. Armor is enough to protect you from fools who still suffer from the need to conquer. God's armor will make you invulnerable and invisible to the worst fools. So there's some very rich imagery here. Uh, you know, Jung has definitely kind of reconverted himself into some new form of Christianity. I won't say Christianity. I'll say he he's he has completed his the alchemical the alchemical marriage, um, the marriage of the bridegroom and the bride, and uh, I don't read madness in his words. I see great beauty and clear thought and I see a deep heart full of real compassion. Um, I, I see and feel and hear and read the pain, you know, that living causes him and that, you know, causes all of us. Powerful stuff, just powerful. Mm, just letting it wash over you is like really something. Okay, continuing top of page 298. Take your God with you. Bear him down to your dark land where people live who rub their eyes each morning and yet always see only the same thing and never anything else. Bring your God down to the haze pregnant with poison, but not like those blinded ones who try to illuminate the darkness with lanterns which it does not comprehend. Instead, secretly carry your God to a hospitable roof. The huts of men are small and they cannot welcome the God despite their hospitality and willingness. Hence, do not wait until... Um, let me say something about that because I read that a certain way, you really, what is for you and within you is really for you ultimately. And it is very difficult and people have a limit for how much they can take of your light because it's blinding. It's blinding. So it's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. 
Hence, do not wait until rawly bungling hands of men back your hack your God to pieces, but embrace him again lovingly until he has taken on the form of his first beginning. Let no human eyes see the much-loved, terribly splendid one in the state of his illness and lack of power. Consider that your fellow men are animals without knowing without knowing it. So long as they go to pasture or lie in the sun or suckle their young or mate with each other, they are beautiful and harmless creatures of dark mother earth. But if the God appears, they begin to rave, since the nearness of God makes people rave. They tremble with fear and fury and suddenly attack one another in fratricidal struggles, since one senses the approaching God and the other. So conceal the God that you have taken with you. Let them rave and maul each other. Your voice is too weak for those raging to be able to hear. And that's so true. When, you know, some people that are caught in the literalness of life and the idolatry of their beliefs, scientific or religious or agnostic even or atheistic, they will not hear what you have to say. Your voice will not over... It just, it's, just, it's just very difficult to get through to people. And usually direct communication like this about this stuff is usually not the way to communicate it. Um, it's usually something tying you together synchronistically that might really speak a lot louder than any words you could ever say, right? Anyway, uh, thus do not speak and do not show to the God, but sit in a solitary place and sing incantations in the ancient manner. And here's the first of the incantations. Here the incantations begin. Set the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it, and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to read the incantations now and wrap up this reading um, on page 299 of the Red Book Reader. Um, this is going to be art, art image 50 through 60. So 10 images kind of accompany randomly these different poems. Uh, or incantations. Poems are incantations. This is incubate. This is a uh, young is uh, this is a call back to the incubating pre Socratic mystics, mystics, healing mystics. Um, young is definitely picked up their their torch and he is carrying it forward here. So th these are some powerful words here, and uh, good good uh, good poems to read maybe before a meditation or for meditation. These are broken up by around different images. So let's start. Christmas has come, which it's Christmas time right now. So that was a interesting synchronicity. <laughs> the God is in the egg. I have prepared a rug for my God, an expensive red rug from the land of mourning. He shall be surrounded by the shimmer of magnificence of his Eastern land. I am the mother, the simple maiden who gave birth and did not know how. I am the careful father who protected the maiden. I am the shepherd who received the message as he guarded his herd at night in dark fields. Image 51. I am the holy animal that stood astonished and cannot grasp the becoming of, God, of, of the God. I am the wise man who came from the east, suspecting the miracle from afar. And I am the egg that surrounds and nurtures the seed of the God in me. Image 52. The solemn hours lengthen, and my humanity is wretched and suffers torment, since I am a giver of birth. Whence do you delight me, O God? He is the eternal emptiness and the eternal fullness. Nothing resembles him, and he resembles everything. Eternal darkness and eternal brightness. Eternal below and eternal above. Double nature in one. Simple in the manifold. Meaning in absurdity. Freedom in bondage. Subjugated when victorious, old in youth, yes and no. Image 53. O light of the middle way, enclosed in the egg, embryonic, full of ardor, oppressed, fully expectant, dreamlike, awaiting lost memories, as heavy as stone, hardened, molten, transparent, streaming bright, coiled on itself. Amen. You are the Lord of the beginning. Image 54. Amen, you are the star of the east. Amen, you are the flower that blooms over everything. Amen, you are the deer that breaks out of the forest. Amen, you are the song that sounds far over the water. Amen, you are the beginning and the end. Image 55. One word that was never spoken, one light that was never lit up, an unparalleled confusion, and a road without end. Image 56. 
I forgive myself these words as you also forgive me for the sake of your blessing, blazing light. Image 57. Rise up, you gracious fire of old night. I kiss the threshold of your beginning. My hand prepares the rug and spreads abundant red flowers before you. Rise up, my friend. You who lay sick, break through the shell. We have prepared a meal for you. Gifts have been prepared for you. Dancers await you. We have built a house for you. Your servants stand ready. We drove herds together for you on green fields. We filled your cup with red wine. We set out fragrant fruit on golden dishes. We knock at your prison and lay our ears against it. The hours lengthen, tarry no longer. We are wretched without you, and our song is worn out. Image 58. We are miserable without you and wear out our songs. We spoke all the words that our heart gave us. What else do you want? What else shall we fulfill for you? We open every door for you. We bend our knees where you want us to. We go to all points of the compass. According to your wish, we carry up what is below and we turn what is above into that which is below, as you command. We give and take according to your wish. We want it to turn right, but go left, obedient to your sign. We rise and we fall. We sway and remain still. We see and we are blind. We hear and we are deaf. We say yes and no, always hearing your word. We do not comprehend and we live the incomprehensible. We do not love and we live the unloved. And we evolve around ourselves again and comprehend and live the understandable. We love and live the loved. True to your law. Come to us, we who are willing from our own will. Come to us, we who understand you from our own spirit. Come to us, we who will warm you at our own fire. Come to us, we who will heal you with our own art. Come to us, we who will produce you out of our own body. Come, child, to father and mother. Image 59. We asked earth, we asked heaven, we asked the sea, we asked the wind, we asked the fire. We looked for you with all the peoples. We looked for you with all the kings. We looked for you with all the wise. We looked for you in our own heads and hearts, and we found you in the egg. Image 60. I have slain a precious human sacrifice for you, a young and old man. I have cut my skin with a knife. I have sprinkled your altar with my own blood. I have banished my father and mother so that you can live with me. I'll just say from my own personal life that I literally have live in banishment from my family and my father and mother, not by choice, but by their choice. But um, still, that line really cut deep for me. What a synchronicity. Uh, back to the reading on page 304, top of 304. This is wrapping up here. I have turned my night into day, went about at midday like a sleepwalker. I have overthrown all the gods, broken the laws, eaten the impure. I have thrown down my sword and dressed in women's clothing. I haven't done that yet, but that's on the list. <laughs> I shattered my firm castle and played like a child in the sand. I saw warriors form into line of battle and I destroyed my suit of armor with a hammer. I planted my field and let the fruit decay. I made small everything that was great and made everything great that was small. I exchanged my furthest goal for the nearest. And so I am ready.